end of Hanukkah who was celebrating? Very nice. Very good. Very nice. We... Can you hear me? You can hear me, Rosalie. Hey, Rosalie, how you doing? Yeah, I'm good. How you doing? Fine. Hi, Susan. I'm doing. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Hi, Bob. Good. That's good. Keep hey it there. up. there. I certainly hope to. No. Yeah. I'm glad I watched the movie, Bob. It was a. Are we going to see it again today? We're going to see it, a 10 minute clip of it, not the entire movie. It was excellent. I, I really. Bill Moyers did a great job with that movie. I have a yes. old copy for a VHS copy. Oh, Hello, Fred. Oh, hi. How are you? I'm here. Doing good, thanks. I'm glad you joined again. This is great. Yeah, well, I enjoyed it last month. Glad we're going to gonna skip. Here. We're going to skip January and go into February for mm -hmm. the next one. Hello, everyone. Hey, Marilyn. Hi. How you doing? Thank you for your help. Hi, Marilyn. Hi, Marilyn. Two Marilyns. Spell <laughs> different. <laughs> Hi, Marilyn. Two Marilyns have been friends a long time, too. Yeah. Yes, we have. Right. Hi, Rosalie. <coughs> Good morning, all. It's me, be, Marilyn. Be, Harvey, how are you doing? You're partly responsible uh, for this. How are you, Bob? Fine. Harvey, remember, you were the one who wanted me to talk about this. So I combined it with the movie class. Of Roosevelt and the Jews. Perfect. Yeah, good way to do it. I'm sorry, say that again. You, Harvey, are <clears> responsible <throat> for this topic. Did you hear me that time? I don't have my sound. I don't think You're Harvey's probably, heard anything I'm saying. Probably muted. There we go. I'm sorry, now I'm on. Harvey, now you were the one who suggested that I requested that I talk about Roosevelt and the Jews. Yeah, so that's what I'm talking about today. That's right. Okay, why did you talk? Why did you ask him to talk about it? Now I forgot that, Harvey. Well, I, I I think I'm a little more critical of FDR than Bob is, oh. uh, mm -hmm. and I, I want to hear what he has to say. I think that. FDR was uh, very remiss in a lot of his treatments of the Jews during the war. Yeah. I would make, agree. I would he agree. Make, he was, and at the same time, well, I don't want to give away my speech, but I'll, I'll be addressing <laughs> it. He had his loyal defenders as well as his harsh critics, and I'm somewhere in between. But in watching the movie that we watched. Beg your pardon? I said in watching the movie that we just watched, Harvey, I think yeah. you didn't get any of the negative feeling about FDR at all. Do you guys think so? I, I the, movie, the movie did not present a negative feeling, but he closed our border. I mean, the, all of his advice. Tell you what, hold, were very let's, let's hold, hold your comments so I can have a okay, discussion. We'll hold, okay. I'd like to give my, if Susan is ready, <laughs> I'd like to begin the session. Okay. Yeah. Susan, you ready? We got two minutes. Okay. okay, well then we'll wait those two minutes because some people are gonna come in on Jewish time. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, then we wouldn't start till 11.30. <laughs> well, I was married to, uh, not married to, I had a job working for a German Jewish leader named Larry Roos, who was an ultimate oxymoron. He was a liberal Republican and, and an honest politician. It was always a half an hour early for anything he went to. So he passed away and I went to the funeral at Temple Israel. There was no casket. He was so he was always 20 minutes or half an hour early. So he had himself buried the day before the funeral. Oh, oh my. wow. No <laughs> typical then. He said his father bought that vault at New Mount Sinai in 1927. He wasn't going to waste a day of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's a good story. Yeah. Yep. 
That's funny. Well, you know you're over 70 when they put you on two different cemetery boards. There was the New Mount Sinai, which I still serve on, and I was on the Bess Medrash HaGodel Cemetery Board. Mm. I had two feet in the grave. Wait, glad you're away from one of them. <laughs> Well, my clock says 11.02, and we already have uh, 29 participants, so I think we can get going, and I will continue to add people um, as they join late <laughs> on Jewish time. Very good. Ready to go? Ready to go. Well, thank you, Susan, and again, thanks to you and Judith, and also to Marilyn Pittler for their help in organizing this and getting the various electronic modes to work properly. I'm just gonna read some prepared remarks as I do have a tendency to go off on tangents if I just don't have some notes to discipline myself. So in our first three sessions of the Fell Film Group, which started on September the 11th, we discussed the career of Charlie Chaplin and his bold satire of Adolf Hitler, which the other major studios were against him producing him, as a matter of fact. The movie was The Great Dictator in which he embraced his physical resemblance to Hitler with his little square mustache to play a Jewish tailor who took the place of Adolf Hitler. And there's a similar movie called The Magic Face, which is a serious version of the same theme. Uh, he took that physical resemblance of Adolf Hitler to puncture the evil ego of the worst mass murderer of Jews in world history. Then the next month on October the 9th, can you all hear me okay? I'm trying to yep. ask voice issues. <coughs> yeah. Hey Mark, how are you? Hi, Bob. October the 9th, we discussed the central role that Jews have played in Hollywood, based in part on Neil Gabler's book, How the Jews Invented Hollywood. In many ways, the Jews are more the people of the flick than they are the people of the book. And if you, when you look at it, the credits after a movie, you almost have to look for the non-Jewish names. Sometimes those are people who change their names. We're very dominant in Hollywood, and that's a whole other story uh, because you know movies were basically invented by Thomas Edison, who was a notorious anti-Semite. When the Jewish moguls got into the act, it changed the direction of, of films forever. Last month on November the 11th, and this year dominated by politics, thank God we don't have to watch those commercials anymore. We had a lively discussion of movies about American politics. There's so many of them, but among those that we talked about were All the King's Men with Broderick Crawford, based on a novel by Robert Penn Warren, it's kind of a satire on the career of Huey Long. We saw The Candidate with Robert Redford, The Best Man. We saw Advise and Consent, which had Charles Lawton playing a Southern Senator. And All the President's Men with Woodward and Bernstein, played by Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman. Today, we complete the 2020 series. Uh, we are going to skip the month of January. I've got some important things that I cannot disengage from. And I, I'm going to take a breather, but we will hopefully resume in February. But today's movie is Bill Meyer's PBS documentary, The Democrat and the Dictator, which traces the parallel careers of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Adolf Hitler, who dominated the world stage from 1933 when they took office until 1945 at the end of World War II, in which each of them died, Hitler by his own hand as the Russians closed in on Berlin, and Franklin Roosevelt in Warm Springs, Georgia, as he was posing for a portrait and he died of a cerebral hemorrhage. That war that Hitler started with this invasion of Poland on September the 1st, 1939, three days before I was born, by the way, which caused 50 million deaths, including 6 million Jews and 291,557 American troops. Before we begin our discussion of the Bill Moyers film, The Democrat and the Dictator, let's watch with Susan Help a 10 minute film clip from Moyers' introduction of this riveting documentary. And then on the other side of it, We'll, we'll talk about it some more. Let's see if this works. <clears throat> Here you go. Very good. Can you make it louder? It's barely, it's sound needs to be louder. I don't know if we can make the sound louder or not because I can't hear it. Can't hear me. 
Can you hear it at all? No. Barely. It's no. Barely. like a whisper. I have my sound on my phone all the way up. Yeah, so do I. Yeah, we hear each other well. It's just Hang on one second. Out. I'm going to try to make it louder. That would be good. It's worth watching. It's very powerful. Although it is that the majority of Germans profited Three. from the first six years of Hitler's rule. He harnessed a powerful tide of national feeling and carried the populace with him. With massive investments in public works and arms, he put idle Germans back to work and made their nation once more a great power in Europe. They loved him for it. Poets proclaimed him the greatest. Professors declared him infinitely wise and clergymen infinitely good. It's true, the brutality of his efficient system kept laggards in line. But even when war came, after the death and destruction had begun, the loyalty of many Germans to Hitler was patriotic and personal. I'm often sickened at the thought that he would have gotten away with his crimes against the Jews and others if only he had not pushed his army and his luck too far. But he did. And that led Franklin Roosevelt to press for the arming of America. Roosevelt devoted the whole of his persuasive arts to warning our country that we couldn't exist in a world half slave and half free. When I watch Hitler and Roosevelt on screen, I'm struck with the way in which film enables us to live simultaneously in past and present. The words of the leaders are ideas incarnated in living breath, evocative and powerful, as human speech can be. But the camera and the microphone arrest the moment. So that while Roosevelt and Hitler are talking about specific events in time, we catch today meanings beyond the calendar's grasp, visions of old that seem freshly minted. We have under a common ideal of democratic government a rich diversity of resources and of peoples functioning together in mutual respect and peace. When es dem international Finanzjudentum in und außerhalb Europas gelingen sollte, die Völker noch einmal in einen Weltkrieg zu stürzen, dann wird das Ergebnis nicht die Bolschewisierung der Erde und damit der Sieg des Judentums sein, sondern die Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. Frankly and definitely, there is danger ahead. Danger against which we must prepare. We cannot escape danger or the fear of it by crawling into bed and pulling the covers over our heads. Es wird stets nur ein Teil eines Volkes aus wirklich aktiven Kämpfern bestehen. Und ihnen wird mehr gefordert als von den Millionen der übrigen Volksgenossen. Für sie genügt nicht die bloße Ablegung des Bekenntnisses, ich glaube, sondern der Spur, ich kämpfe. I have seen war on land and sea, 
I have seen blood running from the wounded. I have seen men coughing out their gassed lungs. I have seen the dead in the mud. I have seen cities destroyed. I have seen children starving. I have seen the agony of mothers and wives. I hate war. Das deutsche Friedensheer ist aufgestellt. Eine gewaltige deutsche Luftwaffe schützt unsere Heimat. Eine neue Macht zur See unsere Küsten. Inmitten der gigantischen Steigerung unserer allgemeinen Produktion wurde es möglich, eine Aufrüstung ohne Zeichen durchzuführen. Jede Institution dieses Reiches steht unter dem Befehl der obersten politischen Führung und alle Institutionen dieses Reiches sind versparen und einig in dem Willen Entschluss, dieses nationalsozialistische Deutschland zu vertreten und wenn notwendig zu verteidigen bis zum letzten Atemzug. The Nazi danger to our Western world has long ceased to be a mere possibility. The danger is here now, not only from a military enemy, but from an enemy of all law, all liberty, all morality, all religion. It is our wish and will that this state and this reich bestehen sollen in the coming years. Wir können glücklich sein zu wissen, dass diese Zukunft restlos uns gehört. This nation has placed its destiny in the hands heads and hearts of its millions of free men and women and its faith in freedom under the guidance of God. Freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. Our support goes to those who struggle to gain those rights and keep them. Our strength is our unity of purpose. To that high concept, there can be no end save victory. It would be nice if morality plays proceeded neatly along their paths, but unfortunately they don't. When we finally found cause to join battle with the Nazi enemies of all law, all liberty, all morality, all religion. It wasn't over what they had done to their subject peoples, but because the Japanese made war on us at Pearl Harbor. Hitler, allied by treaty to Tokyo, honored his word for a change and joined them. Once in the fighting, we found ourselves allied with undemocratic regimes, chief among them that of Stalin, the other great tyrant of the 20th century. So much for neat historical schemes. But all the same, let there be no doubt about it. We were fighting for something which even noble words convey imperfectly. We knew it when we saw it, and even then we couldn't speak it. We understood at the end what it was all about when our advancing armies pierced the heart of the darkness that was Hitler's Germany. There are some things the tongue cannot utter, which the eyes seeing can never forget. I think that's it. Susan, I think that was the entire clip, correct? That's the entire clip. clip. Yeah, so thank you very much. By the way, I, my date of birth was September the 4th, 1939, which was three days after Hitler sent his troops into Poland to start World War II in Europe. And the headline on the Globe Democrat for September the 4th, the British and the French had a, a treaty with Poland and they gave Hitler until noon on September the 3rd. If you remember the movie, The King's Speech, that was given on that date. I was struggling to get out of my mother's womb on that date. And the headline was, Britain and France declare war on Germany. And the, they had a picture of Franklin Roosevelt. And underneath this picture was, were two words, for neutrality. Remember, that was World War II started in Europe before it started in 
the United States of America. And there was a cautionary statement by Joseph Kennedy, who was our ambassador to Great Britain, a notorious anti-Semite, by the way, in addition to being the father of John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and Ted Kennedy. And uh, he said that he hoped that the United States would not get involved. But I hope you'll agree from that film. And by the way, Myron Holson asked, this is the entire session is being recorded. I hope you'll agree that Myers has framed his intertwined biographies of Franklin Roosevelt and Adolf Hitler in a brilliant fashion. The polar opposite rulers had in the words of FDR's 1936 acceptance speech for his second term at the Democratic National Convention, which was called a rendezvous with destiny. And that was a very powerful, one of many stirring speeches of his career. When, you know, he used steel leg braces What's for his that? polio in order to walk. There's no picture. Can't hear you. Did somebody ask me a question? You all still hearing me? Yeah, go ahead, Robert. And go when, ahead. okay, no problem. When Roosevelt walked up towards the speaker's platform on his steel leg braces, one of them caught on the wooden floor and he fell down scattering all of his three by five cars with his notes all over the stage. The, the press corps who happened to be right there, every one of them without being asked to, took the film out of their camera and handed it to his press secretary. Can you imagine that happening today oh. when to a president? So he was oh. given a lot of latitude. This was the rendezvous with destiny speech was one of many stirring addresses given in the course of Franklin Roosevelt's career. It is fitting that we meet to discuss FDR and his evil adversary, Hitler, the very week of FDR's speech to a joint session of Congress on December the 8th, 1941, which began with the words, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Franklin Roosevelt asked for and got Congress to declare a war on Japan. Remember, the country was still very isolationist and anti-Semitism was still very rampant in the country. People like Charles Lindbergh and Father C Charles Coughlin outside of Detroit, who would actually spout pro-Nazi and pro-fascist and anti-Semitic broadcasts. So he was up against a lot of opposition coming into the war. Okay, I get the time to turn this over. So in any way, he, in one of Adolf Hitler's costliest blunders among many, he and his fascist partner Benito Mussolini honored their Axis of Evil Pact with Japan and its wartime premier, Deki Tojo, and declared war on the United States. Japan respected, Japan's very respected Admiral Yamamoto said, he told his countrymen, I fear we have awakened a sleeping giant. Admiral Yamamoto was absolutely right. Franklin Roosevelt saw the necessity for defeating Hitler and Nazi Germany early on but we were not at war, so we could only help his World War II partner, Winston Churchill of Great Britain, through the Lend-Lease program. The two of them had each been assistant secretaries of the Navy in World War I and had known each other going back a number of years. Time does not permit a full discussion of Roosevelt's response to the Holocaust. There are some excellent resources available that can be uh, obtained at the library or the, when the Bratzky Library reopens. Uh, one of them is called FDR and the Jews by Richard Brightman and Alan J. Littman. And then there's FDR and the Holocaust, which contains extensive writings about the various aspects of the Holocaust and how Roosevelt responded to it. There's the famous book, While Six Million Died by Arthur D. Morse and the abandonment of the Jews, which was very critical of Roosevelt and why Auschwitz was never bombed. By the way, Rose, Churchill attempted to get the rail tracks leading into Auschwitz bombed, but his own uh, military people refused. They said that the, the priority had to be to defeat Adolf Hitler and get rid of the Nazi regime. And uh, the Jews would benefit by the cessation of the Holocaust, but they couldn't intervene militarily to stop it, which is one of the things that they're being criticized for. Perhaps Roosevelt's staunchest defender was the author and screenwriter, Dory Sherry, who was the author of a book called Sunrise uh, Campobello, which was a, a, a Tony Award-winning movie, which uh, in which uh, Ralph Bellamy played Franklin Roosevelt very beautifully. There's also the one-man play FDR, which was shown performed locally by Ed Asner, famous Lou Grant actor, at Temple Israel. I interviewed him for about that whole 
episode and his admiration for Hitler was on for rather for Roosevelt was strong as a strong voice against Hitler who did many things to save the Jews during World War II. Roosevelt did create a war refugees board which had some success in rescuing some Jews. He also convened the, the Avian Conference in which 30 different nations around the world were each asked to accept a certain number of Jews and the only country that responded favorably was the Dominican Republic, which offered to take in as many as 100,000 Jews, only about 700 were saved. So it isn't that he didn't try to do something to save the Jews. We have to ask ourselves, would the United States have been better off if, if Herbert Hoover, who was at the nadir of his unpopularity, was a great humanitarian, but would he have been able to summon the uh, United States to stand up to Hitler? What about Alf Landon? Uh, who got, he carried two states in the election of 1936, Maine and Vermont. And there's also Wendell Wilkie, who was a very powerful liberal Republican in the days when there were such things. And then in 1944, his last election, Tom Dewey, the man who uh, ran against Harry Truman in 1948, what if he had been in the White House instead of Roosevelt? Roosevelt was Dr. Fix It Up with the New Deal and Dr. Win the War, who in uh, when he was sworn in as president for his first term, he told the United States, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. He was deeply flawed as all leaders are, so was Winston Churchill. Churchill was known to be an alcoholic buffoon and, and they decided in May of 1940 to give him the job of prime minister of Great Britain, expecting him to fail within a matter of months. But Churchill gave a sp his famous speech, I have nothing to offer you but blood, sweat and tears and all of his cabinet immediately became his loyal followers. So overall, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill were right people at the right time to utterly defeat Adolf Hitler, the very embodiment of evil. So I, the floor is now open to questions, comments, discussions. Feel free to disagree or agree as, as the case may be. Bob, Sheldon Anger. Anger. One of the, you, well, mentioned, hi, you mentioned a number of wonderful resources. There's a relatively new book out. It was just published earlier this year that I think was worth a read. And that is uh, about uh, Roosevelt and the Jews prior to, well, actually uh, throughout the war, but mostly during the 1930s, when there would have been an opportunity to do something in Germany and Austria. The title of the book is called Keep the Jews Quiet which was his message to a prominent Jewish leader in terms of uh, keep, uh, not letting the Jews interfere in terms of public policy. And he's assured, giving assurances that at some point the Jews would be okay. It's a really, it's a condemnation of Roosevelt and his conduct during the 1930s. That's a very good resource and was certainly deserves to be checked out. There were a lot of people who had great influence on Roosevelt, but they didn't want to use up their own personal, social, and political capital with him, so they were reluctant to take him on. Valid and point. He had a very magnetic and charismatic personality, and he would have the ability to just completely agree with some person, and then somebody else would come into his office, and he would completely agree with an exactly the opposite position. There's a two-volume biography of Roosevelt. One is called The Lion and the Fox. He was like, he could be a lion, he could roar like a lion, but he also was as sly as a fox politically. And so, and the other one was called Soldier of Freedom. And so many of the biographies of Roosevelt were kind of unquestionably admiring, but that book that you mentioned is fascinating. I certainly want to get a copy. And it's written by it Robert, it was written by Robert Medoff, who is a leading Holocaust scholar. Appreciate the recommendation very much. Other comments, Bob, questions? This I have a question. Uh, Bob, uh, his State Department was extremely anti-Semitic, mm. and uh, this might help to influence him. I think Roosevelt <clears throat> was a great president, uh, but I do feel there was a tinge of anti-Semitism. Uh, it goes back, <clears throat> they wouldn't let uh, the ship St. Louis land in mm -hmm. the United States. They turned it away. They had an opportunity to save the Jews there. His uh, refusal uh, to bomb the trains uh, going to the Auschwitz. Uh, they were bombing right near it. Uh, and, and just one or two missions might have accomplished the purpose. 
Um, I don't think Roosevelt was anti-Semitic, but I do think that he did listen to a lot of his people and didn't do all he could to help the Jews. And that's a fair assessment. Certainly, David Wyman has wrote uh, an article for Commentary Magazine, Why Auschwitz Was Never Bombed. And he also wrote a book that I referenced earlier called The Abandonment of the Jews. And there are many fine books that document all that. The landing of the St. Louis that was popularized, if that's the right term, or, or called to the public's attention in a very riveting way by the movie called Voyage of the Damned. And for many years, it, it appeared that all of the Jews on that ship, the St. Louis, were sent back to Europe and they all perished in the Holocaust. About half of them did, but another half of them ended up coming back to the United States safely. And again, we were not at war at that particular time. Eleanor Roosevelt played a very constructive role vis-a-vis -vis the Jews. And in her own memoir, she said that one of her greatest regrets was not pressing him hard enough to get to St. Louis to land and not doing enough to further the rescue of the Jews. Now Roosevelt himself, because he has so many Jewish supporters, he had like a 95% approval rating and uh, polls indicating that the people would vote for him among the Jews. No other president has come even close to, he was even the victim of Roosevelt. They were calling him Rosenfeld mm -hmm. and saying he was in the back pocket of the Jews. So uh, all these comments have great validity. He was probably wrong to run for that fourth term. And uh, he, he hardly even knew Harry Truman, who was described as a child on the toboggan sled. Harry did not know about the Manhattan Project until after he was already picked to be Roosevelt's running mate. And FDR, I think, met with him only once. And uh, fortunately, Harry Truman had the backbone and the courage, give him hell Harry, and he was the president who would recognize Israel 11 minutes after it was founded. It's not at all certain that Ro Franklin Roosevelt would have recognized the Jewish state because he had promised King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia that he would never do that. So it was fortuitous that he passed away before he could be in a position to make that decision. There's a, a new book out about Harry Truman, which I could talk about in a, in a future program uh, called, which was very praiseworthy towards Harry Truman uh, and his role in the post Roosevelt era. Appreciate those suggestions. Uh, I have a question. Yes, in, Marilyn. In the thirties, was it perhaps our isolationism plus the anti-Semitism that politically Roosevelt felt he needed to not intervene, that, that he was playing more politics than humanitarian, more politics well, were in his head than humanitarian thoughts? And what, I mean, what's the name of the book referring to Truman? It's called, um, I have it in another room. It's just it's Joe Scarborough, the guy who's, who does the, he's on CNN, oh. was the oh, author yeah. of it. Right. Uh, so okay. Harry Truman and the Cold War and the struggle for freedom. And it's extremely praiseworthy of Harry Truman. And uh, I ordered a copy, I just got it. I haven't started reading it yet, but it's, a, it's an excellent, very slim volume. The best biography of Truman, of course, is the one by, um, McCullough, David McCullough. Yeah. yeah, so about one volume and it goes into great detail. Clark Clifford, who was a St. Louis politician, was largely responsible for persuading Hitler, not Hitler, Truman, to honor his commitment to Chaim Weizmann to recognize the Jewish state. And he, uh, no less than George Marshall, the Secretary of State in World War II hero, told Truman at a meeting that if he recognized Israel, that he would not. Uh, support him in the coming election. But Truman went ahead anyway, said I made it my, a promise to Chaim Weizmann and I'm going to keep that promise, which he did. Otherwise it would not have been in Israel. And there was, Marilyn, the uh, isolationism was the most popular viewpoint. And I'm concerned that nowadays there's kind of an isolationist impulse. You can overdo anything. You can intervene at the drop of a hat sometimes that perhaps was true during the administration of George W. Bush, you can overdo that and then you can become so isolationistic that you allow horrible things to take place. So it's, you know, like somebody once said, where do you draw the line? And the answer is you draw it in the right place. Mm -hmm. And history does repeat itself, but it never is an exact repeat. It's more of a rhyme than an echo. Good question. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments, observations? Um, yes. Um, 
I just I kind of remember um, that one of Roosevelt's advisors was a rabbi. I believe his name was Stephen Weiss. That was right? Stephen Weiss was the great Reform Jewish leader, and uh, he was extremely prominent. He actually had a rally to save the Jews that filled Madison Square Garden, the same Madison Square Garden where the German American Bund had 10,000 people all saying Sig Heil to Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but uh, Stephen Weiss was from the old rabbinic school and there's some recordings available of him speaking, we must oppose the Nazi regime with every fiber of our being. Those were the days of great oratory. Those days okay, are long but, gone. But I'm, I'm kind of remembering, didn't he sort of express the view that the Jews in America didn't want this to become a Jewish war, or someone didn't want it to become a Jewish war. That sentiment has been a lot. You know, of course, one of the things that Hitler said in that film clip was that if the, if the Jewish financiers force the world into uh, another war, the result will be the annihilation of the Jews of Europe. Now, he damn well nearly succeeded. There were you know, 18 million Jews when uh, Hitler came to power. And after the Holocaust, it was reduced to, you know, 12 million, and now it's about 14 million worldwide. So he, he annihilated two thirds of the Jews of Europe. And uh, there's a dispute discussed at great length in some of the books that I referenced. How early did Roosevelt know for sure what was going on? And the, the closest documented evidence is a letter by Gerhard Reiner, who was with the World Jewish Congress, who it was in 1942. And I remember seeing the, a text of the letter in which he said, already some 2 million of our co-religious have been done to death, was the language that he used. It was going on and lots of people knew about it. Bob, the book that I referred to earlier about Keep the Jews Quiet uh, dealt primarily with uh, Roosevelt's relationship with uh, 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 Stephen um, White's uh, from, Stephen uh, White. Uh, yeah. Right. And how he was really played. And he knew he was being played. Uh, he, uh, the rabbi had been to Germany, saw firsthand what was occurring, reported it to, uh, to Roosevelt. And Roosevelt kept playing him in, in terms of, you got to keep us under control. Uh, we'll deal with it in time. Oh, shoot, it froze and again. Everything to de defer any action. So it's um, White is is doesn't come out as a hero in that book. The book is well, uh, he would the book is, the, go the, ahead. The deafening silence Shame. by uh, the same author who wrote raised, and it talks about a lot of the reform leaders were very much opposed to the uh, Zionist demonstrations Absolutely. against the Nazis and Stephen yeah. White and I can't think of the other names, but they really opposed. Uh, somewhat the entering of America into the war because it would feel like it was being Jewish war and anti-Semitism would even get worse because we would be pushing, you know, the, the isolation policies. Well, there's another interesting, the local rabbi, Rabbi Ferdinand Esserman, who was a longtime rabbi of Temple Israel, right. went to Berlin in 1933, just weeks after Hitler came to power. And he went back in 1934, 1935, he visited with the members of the Jewish community, and he came back and gave a sermon, which you can still get a copy of at the CRC gift shop, called Sentenced to Death, the Jews of Germany. This is 1933, in which he goes chapter and verse as to what was being done. Hitler came to power in January of 1933, and by March, <laughs> Dachau was already up and running. At the time of the 1936 Olympics, it was a going concern. So uh, there was also an effort by a philanthropist to place an ad in all the Jewish owned newspapers in New York, the New York Times, the New York Daily News and the New York Post, calling for a boycott of German goods. All three of those major newspapers turned them down. So the Nation Magazine as a public service ran his appeal to boycott German goods. I think also was that Hans Mergenthal was the Secretary of the Treasury and his role was somewhat questionable. There were a lot of Jews who were terrified that it would be called a Jewish war and would stir up anti-Semitism. And it also goes back, I think, because a lot of the, even though German Jews were, became much more identified with Germany and uh, 
In America, they, there was always this uh, underlying discrimination against Eastern European Jews, you know, people coming in from Poland and different countries. And the German Jews always had a higher opinion of themselves versus uh, Eastern European Jewry. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that was one of the motivations for the whole creation of uh, the Jewish Federation movement because there were Jews from Eastern Europe who were schnorrers, who were beggars on the street, and they embarrassed some of the uh, old German Jewish families. So they created the Jewish hospital to provide a place for Jewish physicians who weren't able to get appointed at non-Jewish hospitals to take care of Jewish patients, and they were very eager. And matter of fact, there was a very deep split. You can read about it, Walter Ehrlich's history of the St. Louis Jewish community between the German Jews and the Russian Jews. You had Westwood Country Club, which catered to the German Jewish population. So the East European ones created Meadowbrook. And it wasn't until the 1970s when the two groups started coming together. Walter Ehrlich said that when uh, at Soldan High School, when uh, East European Jews and Russian Jews and German Jews started dating each other that the prejudice started going down, but it's a real factor for sure. Bob, another take, I'd like, another take I'd like to share with you on Roosevelt, and that is he obviously had a lot of, a lot of talent and a lot of capabilities, and he certainly is responsible for the social uh, 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 resp uh, responses in the 1930s and leading the war effort in the 40s. But he was fundamentally a politician. He was a skilled politician. Very he understood skilled. that the United States was isolationist. He understood the, that the United States could care less about its Jewish population. He knew that there was a tremendous level of anti-Semitism throughout the country. He also understood that the Pew organization had done a report, a study in terms of American attitudes towards increasing the Jewish population, increasing the Jewish immigration from Germany and Austria. And 85% of the non-Jews who submitted, who took that uh, uh, survey said they don't want any more Jews in this country. No. So, so he understood in terms of that there wasn't any gonna be any political payback off for him, for him to intervene on behalf of the Jews. Well, well put and well documented, all 100% true. And uh, he didn't want to use up, he didn't want to oppose those people too publicly uh, because they were very much against making this into a Jewish war. And there are some interesting studies about how the general media responded to it. The New York Times always would bury stories relating to the persecution of the Jews in its back pages. And it was a Jewish owned newspaper, the Salzberger family, which still are part owners of the New York Times. The New York Times did not have a good record with respect to that. But as you say, Roosevelt was a very, that's why the lion and the fox, the fox in him knew that he couldn't just take a bold bellowing stance against what was happening in Europe at the beginning. He had to win that over. He did, he and Churchill though, <coughs> clearly saw the menace of Hitler. And whenever he and Churchill and Stalin got together, they would always reiterate that their first goal was the f elimination of Adolf Hitler, his physical elimination, and the denazification of Europe, both of which were accomplished. Again, uh, so th I'm personally grateful that Roosevelt and Churchill did have the war effort, even though each of them had their share of faults. Good comments. I have the book, um, Bob, Marilyn Alton. I have the book FDR and the Jews by Alan Lickman. And what yes. it said in there, number one, was that Eleanor Roosevelt at the beginning was not a friend of the Jews, but she changed. And then it also said that the reason, one of the reasons Roosevelt would not permit the Jews in, which I thought was, of course, terrible, was that he considered them as immigrants. And he didn't want to be known as a president who let immigrants in. Now, that was in the book. So I, but I personally... I agree with Harvey, what he said. I agree with you, too, but I agree with Harvey. Harvey, I, I do not think, and Eric Larson, who's written books, he, he appeared in Chautauqua, and I asked him the question. He's written some books about Roosevelt. If he thought Roosevelt was anti-Semitic and would not permit the Jews in, and he said yes. Now, I, he, I, I can't say he's an authority, but he did say that.
he's a respected writer and I, I've met him a couple of times and I respect his work. Again, there are, this is an issue that will never be fully resolved. I think as we've had a healthy discussion of all the different aspects of the case, I appreciate especially Sheldon Anger, who's a very serious historian in his own right, that uh, he shared his perspectives with us. Uh, Eric Larson uh, is, an, is an excellent writer and uh, worthy of respect. He wrote a book about the uh, 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. It was a, a, a mystery. Now, by the way, the, the use of media is very important. Roosevelt was the first president to give a televised speech it was at the Chicago World's Fair in the year 1939. And uh, he used the radio, which was the pop most popular medium, and he would have these fireside chats. So he was not only a, a riveting speaker when it came to speaking to large groups, but he also made very effective use of the media. And then Adolf Hitler with his uh, propaganda minister Goebbels uh, also uh, made skilled use of the media, especially film. It was the producer of the book, uh, rather the film, The Triumph of the Will, which is Lenny Riefenstahl, who was, whose work is admired, sad to say, even though she was Hitler's chief film propagandist. And uh, you, you watch The Triumph of the Will, you can see the grandeur that Hitler produced. And it's interesting that Roosevelt was born into great wealth and power, whereas Hitler was born into poverty. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments, observations? Somebody sent me a, a notification about Eric Larson's, that book that I was referring to. I actually um, wrote in the comments and I'll just read it and maybe you can um, answer, Bob. I put, I'm, I'm not clear why they didn't bomb the railroads. Is it because they didn't think people were really being killed in the camps? Was, was no, they, the they knew that people were being killed. They just didn't want to divert the official excuse by the military. They did not want to divert resources, even though uh, David Wyman correctly points out that they, they were bombing factories in the vicinity of Auschwitz, right in the very vicinity of Auschwitz. And uh, they could have done so, and they did not. The Churchill in some of his memoirs indicated that he actually ordered his generals to do it, but they refused. So, which is kind of unusual to, if they would actually refuse that. They could have an anti-Semitism involved there, uh, or, or perhaps not. Uh, Eisenhower clearly insisted that uh, the Polish neighbors of Auschwitz walk through the camp and see for themselves what had happened. I visited Auschwitz myself as part of a Jewish press mission during a blizzard, and uh, it was a very harrowing experience to say the least to see the crematoria still st intact. There were efforts to blow them up at the end of the war and uh, to see the death factory that they had produced. And it was definitely what by the 19, by the time the United States got into the war in 1941, I'm not sure this was well known, by 1942, there was no excuse for not knowing what was going on. The second part of my question was, um, do you think Israel would be in existence today if there hadn't been a Holocaust. I'm sorry, say that again, the second question. Do you think Israel would be in existence today if there hadn't been a Holocaust? All right, I, I doubt that it would have been. And, and it, the Israelis themselves got very defensive and angry if you say that Israel was created as an excuse for the Holocaust. But at the time, the, start, the best speech in favor of the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine was the ambassador, the Russian ambassador to the United Nations, Andrei Gromyko, gave the most passionate pro-Israel speech at that particular time. And it, technically, the Soviet Union recognized, and they wanted to dis displace the British, but they also helped liberate a lot of the camps the Red Army did. So that certainly was one of the factors. Bob, let me offer a different opinion on that, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, there was significant Jewish immigration to uh, Palestine prior to World War II, even prior to the 1930s. Uh, so much so that the, that the British High Commission for uh, the uh, supervision of Palestine actually proposed a partition in 1936 called the, based on the, the Peel Report 
which is right. a special commission appointed by the British government to see what should they do with this administration of, of Palestine. And there was a Jewish state that was proposed. And of course, the Arabs uh, wouldn't, didn't approve it. And I think even had World War II not occurred in time, there would have been a Jewish state in that part of the world. That's a possibility. By the way, if the Peel Commission report had been adopted, let's say a Jewish state had come into existence, the, the conference actually took place in London in 1937. The Arab High Commissioner uh, at the time was, uh, was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajiman al Husseini, if you remember him from the movie Exodus. Absolutely. He was a guy who went to pay his respects to Adolf Hitler, put on a swastika armband, yes. and he organized a, a unit of the SS in Bosnia. So he was no great friend of the Jews. All oh, that's valid. But let's say, let's say that the state had been established with law of return in 1937. One year later was Kristallnacht. And there could be no doubt after Kristallnacht what the motivation, what the goal of the Germans was, was clearly to annihilate the Jews of Europe. There's another important movie called Von C, W-A-N-S-S-E-E, -E, about a meeting that took place in January of 1942 of the top echelon of the Nazi party at Hitler's direction to come up with what they called the final solution of the Jewish problem. The only debate that they had around the table, uh, and I had an opportunity, by the way, to visit that, the very room in which that meeting took place, was whether or not people of mixed blood, Michelin as they were called, would uh, be spared uh, annihilation. And the vote of the group around the table was no, that anybody with any quote unquote Jewish blood had to be eliminated. So they were completely implacable. So, also, the Palestinians could have had their state at, at that particular time as well. And it's interesting that in recent days, we've seen the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and the Sudan, and Morocco is the most recent Arab state to recognize Israel and establish full relations. Mm -hmm. And that the Palestinians, Abba Ibn once said the Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Mm -hmm. They have an opportunity to have their independent state. If they, and I think possibly that might take place uh, under the Biden administration. Even a lot of these other things were done during the Trump administration. Good, good Bob, points. Bob, yeah. it's interesting. I remember growing up, my parents thought that FDR was God's gift to the world. He did so much for our own country, so much good for our country uh, in his term of office. And I think they just sort of I never heard a negative word ever from either of my parents. And it was, I think my generation more that started looking at him as having two sides. The side that was so good for us inside the United States and the other side that didn't jump in soon enough to help the Jews. Good night. I remember April the 12th, 1940, very clearly I was living on Westgate Avenue in Del Mar Loop. And there was a kid running through the alley saying, President Roosevelt is dead. President Roosevelt is dead. And it sounded like a negative version of you know, the British are coming. And I thought that God had fallen out of the sky. And I remember my mother sent my brother up to the corner to buy an extra issue of the Post-Dispatch showing Truman being sworn in. And uh, my mother said, oh, he's nothing but a cheap thug from Kansas City, part of the Pendergast gas machine. He'll, he'll never be a Roosevelt. It wasn't until the post-war years, and especially, I think, Sheldon, maybe you'll back me up on this. The publication of the book, While Six Million Died by Arthur D. Morris, was the first chink in the armor of Roosevelt. But clearly, when he died, people thought the world was going to come to an end. He was already, he probably should not have run for that fourth term because he was clearly dying by that particular time. By April the 12th, 45, he was gone. I do agree so, with you, Bob. I think part of what's, what has occurred over time is your profession the news media has really expanded in its, in its coverage and has been much more candid uh, in terms of uh, the way it reports the news. There was a time where my perception was that the news media would block out anything that was negative about the United States. It wouldn't print it. And so you didn't get a total picture. And there's, today there's so many more sources, maybe too many, but that's another conversation. But uh, I think the way news is reported now is very, very different. 
uh, than it was during the 1930s and the early 1940s when it was all about patriotism and uh, not looking at the negative sides of what our country was what was doing uh, doing. Yeah, and FDR didn't want to work the room. The media loved him, and they didn't want to risk their access to him by publishing anything negative. And more recent, I would say during the past five or six years, maybe even going back as far as uh, the George W. Bush term, we have, we don't have the truth anymore. We have competing narratives. CNN has one reality, MSN and, and Fox News has another reality, and there's no common ground, no. no uh, overlap between them. And I used to think it was wrong to have liberal Republicans like Jacob Javis and Nelson Rockefeller and conservative Democrats, but I no longer feel that way. I think it's important for both parties to have the incentive to compromise. And I'm hoping that maybe that will happen in the future, but uh, I'm not entering my profession right now, then it's a very different atmosphere. There's no, there's no commitment to real objectivity anymore. Well, that's just I, personal. You know, comment. Particularly when you talk about something, uh, some of the news media on either extreme, it's not really reporting facts anymore. It's reporting opinions. You're right. It's reporting opinions on events, and people think they're getting facts, but they're really getting a colored view on, on the part of the so called reporter. Very well. Uh, by the way, I watched the Time Magazine selection of the person of the year yesterday. Uh, and the person of the year is supposed to be somebody yeah. who influenced the news. Hitler, good. Hitler was among their previous recipients of that award or that distinction. Uh, ha Henry Luce, Harry Luce, who was the co founder of Time Magazine, was a right wing Republican. So whenever he would publish a picture of Franklin Roosevelt, he would be on the left of the center of the page. <laughs> And he was doing that on purpose. He would describe the exactly the same action. If a Democrat did it, it was one way. If a Republican did it, it was entirely different. He would say Eisenhower strode to the lectern. So when you hear somebody striding to the lectern, here's this five-star general who led D-Day with a great military bearing. He strides to the podium. Truman shambled to the lectern. Same exact action, but the, the, the language that you're using. Uh, Nixon wept which is the shortest, uh, Sheldon, you're the expert on the New Testament, shortest chapter in the New Testament is Jesus wept. So people in their minds said, well, Jesus wept, now Nixon wept. Humphrey blubbered. And they're describing the same action with the choice. Of, so this is nothing really new of shading people's public opinion. And uh, so that could be a, a session, a future film session. There are a lot of good movies out there about the, the press, including all the president's men. Yeah, I do think it's more than just using the language. I think it's really even the, the way the, the events are reported are so biased now. It's, a, it's an alternative universe. You're completely right. And it's, uh, the public suffers. Larry, did you have a question, Larry Alton? Myra, your question? So we have about Bob, five I'll step in one second. What stood out to me about your movie, what was so frightening to me was when Hitler spoke, the response of the people. And exactly. not getting into politics, but now that's how the people are reacting today, the thousands of people. That was what was so frightening to me. It is frightening. And if you remember the, the wonderful movie, Judgment at Nuremberg, where Burt Lancaster played Ernst Yaring who was a judge in Nazi Germany. Right. And uh, he had a, a very wonderful summation speech saying the problem with Nazi Germany was not hate, it was love. They love this man who got who went up to the lectern and he would speak at first in a very soft voice to get the attention of the group. And then at 10 minutes into the speech, they would be saying, seek Heil, seek Heil, seek Heil. Mm -hmm. One massive sea of humanity doing that. Did you have a question? Bob, Bob, Steve, Redis. yes. Uh, you didn't talk about Eddie Jacobson from uh, Kansas City, who was uh, the haberdashery partner with Harry Truman. And I've read- He was a partner of Harry Truman's and he uh, met with Harry Truman. Matter of fact, Truman said, I don't want to see that high and white sort of Ben Gurion. I don't want to hear from any of them at all. They're driving me every five minutes to get another call. And they said, well, your old business partner, Eddie Jacobson, wants to have one last opportunity to talk to you. He said, well, he was my business partner. So let him come in and Jacobson 
according to numerous sources, including David McCullough's book and Clark Clifford's memoirs, talked Truman into allowing Hyam Weissman to have one more conversation with him in which Truman promised to recognize the partition plan and ultimately vote for recognizing Israel. That's a whole other subject, but it's, it's relevant to this topic because if, if Roosevelt had selected somebody else other than Truman, it's not for sure that that would have happened. It's a very interesting point, the little what ifs. What if Donald Trump had kept his mouth shut and his hand off the Twitter for his entire term? Would he have been as reviled by so many people if he had watched his P's and Q's? On the other hand, his rabid supporters like him to do that. So it's interesting to see. Uh, Biden has been described as refreshingly boring because we've had chaos and drama for the past four years and maybe the country could use a dose of some quiet. That's just a personal aside. Be with you. Any other questions or comments? Kind of, I enjoy this discussion. Remember, it's, it's we're going to skip. It, it's interesting that you mentioned judgment at Nuremberg because I have a, a girlfriend that I, I've been friends with since kindergarten days in Chicago. She's not Jewish. Her father was from Germany. Uh, he was from a very wealthy family that basically was the main uh, provider of oats in Germany. And she discovered later, I think back in the 80s, that her father's mother, her grandmother, was Jewish. And the family was left alone because they were providing the oats. <coughs> but another thing, her father was one of the judges in Germany in the 1930s. And he left, he left before 38, came to America because he said, I cannot abide by changing the laws. And I understand. That be a part of the judges, and whereas that one judge in judgment at Nuremberg stayed. I, 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 it's a very good point. I know that Phil has a question. Also, the we had Whitney Harris, who was a very prominent attorney, right. who was on the prosecution staff at Nuremberg trials, and there was a woman named Hetty Epstein. After the war, her parents were killed at Auschwitz, and so she was on the staff of the trial of the doctors. And if you want to, I defy anybody to read the account the doctors of infamy is called which describes the cruelty to which uh, people at the death camps were subjected by uh Mengele and others who had these cruel exp medical experiments it's almost impossible to read larry did you have a question i think phil may have a question yeah i had, yes i had a, a question first of all i i, I think the uh the whole Roosevelt clan, even though they didn't get along with uh, Teddy and, and Franklin and their families didn't get along, I thought they were all anti-Semitic. But the, um, has anybody uh, written a book about what happened if, if, uh, if uh, Germany had not declared war on the United States? Has, did they ever do a perspective on what Roosevelt would have done vis-a-vis -vis the Jews and, um, and helping England um, I can, answer, well, I can answer that in the brief time that's remaining. There have been several books. One is called The Man in the High Castle, which speculates what would have happened if, if the Nazis and the Japanese, God forbid, had won World War II. There's another one called The Plot Against America by the recently oh. deceased Philip Roth. Marvelous. In the 1940 election that Charles Lindbergh would have run as a Republican against Franklin Roosevelt and made peace with Nazi Germany and what the world would look like. There's also a book called The Fatherland, which speculates on a, a, a Nazi victory in Europe and uh, a pro-Nazi person you know, making peace with them. So there's several really good, most of them are works of called alternative history fiction. Uh, so those are interesting to read. And a couple of them are made into television movies. Maybe we could, we could watch one of those in a future discussion. As long as we're talking about books, I'll tell you about another one that actually Phil Kaplan told me about. And it really is a great read. It's by a German historian named Goetz Alley. Alley spelled A L L Y. Title of the book is Why the Germans, Why the Jews? Why did the Germans act the way they did? Why did the Jews, why did they pick on the Jews? And it's not for some of the traditional reason, reasons, uh, according to Alley. Alley talks about it, so, so, the, the Jews. Germany being run down, depressed. The Jews were prosperous, had money. The Germans were motivated 
to take over the properties owned by the Jews. Why the Germans? There was all this this theory about the war, their war effort experienced a stab in the back in terms of uh, for the, it, the uh, and the German the military feeling they were sold out by social Democrats and Jews, uh, where in fact, they were really losing the war, but they withheld that information from the press and the press gave every tape uh, talking about the Jews, about the Germans be uh, military winning. And then uh, they have to have a rationale for why did they lose? They got stabbed in the back. And part of that was uh, the, the stabbers or the Jews in the industrial society in Germany. And then, Great read. There's no, also a book recently published for good suggestion. All your suggestions, uh, Sheldon, were excellent. There's one called uh, Britain at Bay, which talks about how Great Britain got through World War II. There's another one called The Last 100 Days of the Weimar Republic, which discusses the weaknesses of the democracy that had been imposed on Germany after World War I. All of them are, there's a whole spate of books. There's a multi-volume biography of Adolf Hitler, <laughs> and uh, a new biography of Eleanor Roosevelt. So we have an endless inventory. I understand that there's somebody who has a, a final question for us, uh, Susan. Yeah, I think Rosalie, um, you had your hand up. That's gonna be the final question or comment. It's um, already a few minutes after noon. Go ahead, Rosalie. You have to unmute, Rosalie. I'm unmuting, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, well, my only thing was, uh, I'm so glad that I saw the Bill Moyer thing, because I, I think it just brought prominence to what kind of a um, wonderful um, person um, and ability Franklin Roosevelt had to be a politician and to, to inspire, inspire people of all, of all kinds at all times. And um, I also saw in uh, watching his expose of uh, Hitler, uh, the ability to inspire in a different way. And exactly. I think the relation between the two was uh, so, so interesting to watch and how people can be, become mesmerized. And I think that's what we have going on right now in America, which I Very became good. fascinated with, that people well, become mesmerized by a particular um, personality. Yeah. One of the observations is a good point that, that FDR made when he saw films of the rabid Hitler youth. He said, we need to have American youth as passionate for democracy as Hitler is youth are for his dictatorship. And he, now Roosevelt had a voice where he could read a tomato can label and sound like a very authoritative and beautifully inspirational term. He came back yeah. from his final trip to Europe saying, you'll forgive me if I give this speech sitting down. I've just traveled 10,000 miles and I have to use steel leg braces. And you know, he had this winning personality. So, yeah. so anyway, Definitely. Uh, Susan tells me I'm out of time. Thank you all very much. You have I a good- I want to end quickly by thanking Bob for another fantastic presentation. I'm always amazed. Bob is like a walking encyclopedia. What We would have to Google facts and, and names and dates. He just pulls out of his head. And um, he's a brilliant person, a brilliant speaker. And we so enjoy having you, Bob. Thank you so much. This Susan, has been back. wonderful. Thank you, Bob. Great, Bob. Thank you very much. Great right presentation, much. Bob. So we're taking a break in January and we'll be back in February. And of course, I will keep you up to date on topics, dates, and li Zoom links. Thank you, and everyone. And your, suggestions, Thank your you. suggestions as to movies that we could talk about are absolute. Email them to me or to Susan or to both. And Thank Susan, you all very you've much. you've been doing a wonderful job. Happy, Thank you, Susan. Happy Thank Hanukkah you. to all. Thanks, Marilyn. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Bob. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Happy Hanukkah. You My too. pleasure. Thank Susan, you are terrific. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.